Hello everybody, this is Antonio Wolf. Continuing reading the Chinese family and kinship. So uh, continuing on to chapter 2. So the individual and the family. The continuum of descent. In chapter 1, we said that the Chinese saw the family as the basic unit of society, and we touched on the important role which Confucian philosophers gave to it. We must now explore this idea further and see just how far the life of the individual was dominated by his family. It is perhaps not unreasonable to say that in the West we see the family as an institution which exists in large part to provide an environment in which the individual can be conveniently raised and trained to go out into the world as a full member of society. An indication of the validity of this notion is the breakup of the family when the children reach adulthood. But the emphasis in the traditional Chinese situation was reversed. It was not the family which existed in order to support the individual, but rather the individual who existed in order to continue the family. At this point we may consider an idea which will help to throw light on Chinese attitudes, even if in itself it is rather far-fetched. <coughs> And that is the idea that there is an underlying assumption in Chinese thinking on the family that there is such a thing as a continuum of descent. By this I mean simply that descent is a unity, a rope which began somewhere back in the remote past and which stretches on to the infinite future. The rope at any one time may be thicker or thinner according to the number of strands, families or fibers, male individuals, which exist, but so long as one fiber remains, the rope is there. The fibers at any one point are not just fibers, they are representatives of the rope as a whole. That is, the individual alive is the personification of all his forebears and all of his descendants yet unborn. He exists by virtue of his ancestors, and his descendants exist only through him. And we shall see later that we can treat these statements vice versa, with almost equal validity. To continue our crude analogy, the rope stretches from infinity to infinity, passing over a razor which is the present. If the rope is cut, both ends fall away from the middle, and the rope is no more. If the man alive now dies, without error, the whole continuum of ancestors and unborn descendants dies with him. In short, the individual alive now is a manifestation of this whole continuum of descent. His existence is, as an individual is necessary but insignificant besides his existence as the representative of the whole. Quote, Life must go on. The generations stretch back thousands of years to the great ancestor parents. They stretch for thousands of years into the future, generation upon generation. Seen in proportion to this great array, the individual is but a small thing. But on the other hand, no individual can drop out. Each is a link in the great chain. No one can drop out without breaking the chain. End quote. It's interesting. Uh, imagine being an only child and killing yourself. <laughs> in Chinese culture, you know? So you're basically <coughs> destroying a, a long, long hope rope that that w existed existed previous to your to your uh, suicide, right? <laughs> you're killing yep. many people. Yep. Yeah. <coughs> There's very interesting metaphysics to it uh, that gets uh, explained as we go th through this chapter. Because <clears throat> that's to do with the whole the nature of ancestor worship and why it, how the ancestors exist only through the living descendants who worship them, no descendants and therefore you know no ancestors because there's the ancestors themselves there's a died. Book, there's a book Richard Winfield mentions a lot <clears throat> in one of his courses, which talks about the the family tradition of the Greeks and 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 Romans, you know, and there are a lot of similarities. Because yeah, yeah. they had their religion was a familiar religion, and they truly believe believed that the their ancestors uh, actually needed them to feed them. You know, like <coughs> you the, the idea of giving food, offering food to a shrine in your home was it's kind of lit, kind of literal. You know, people really believed that. Your descendants, your descent would be responsible to to provide to you in your death, in your afterlife, in a sense, you know. So there wasn't <coughs> this already op operative, this fixed uh, difference between 
uh, his cog cogita uh, his tensa you know mm -hmm. the, like those are one of those situations that you can clearly see that they didn't make yet the difference between the uh, immaterial soul and spirit and the material body right yeah i know what book you're talking about i have it and i i read a bit of it but i haven't i, I never finished it but very interesting book. i really enjoyed that book uh it's also structured like this book as far as i remember it's it also has like this very slow build-up of like how this somewhat yeah. logically happened like it's not meant to be logical but it is logical because it's following yeah, a yeah. train development yeah yeah and it's an inverse interpretation of what what usually we see right because nowadays it's hard to see a certain book which which fleshes out the consequences of certain creeds right in the economical field, in the fa familiar field, etc., etc., we usually see the opposite. We see things explaining creeds, right? Things explaining uh, certain dynamics. And I find it interesting that we can find those these historical books that actually give spirit a bit of its share in the causal chain of things, you know? Yeah. All right, continuing. To say that the individual was dominated by the family, then, is another way of saying that the individual was dominated by his continuum of descent. But it happens that family is a concept representative of the continuum which we can more easily grasp. We can now see that it makes great sense that the actions of the individual in Chinese society were geared to the requirements of the family. In a way, the individual was the family, just as he was his own ancestors and his own descendants. He received his descent and his body from his parents, and he held them in trust for his sons. They were not his to dispose of lightly. Quote, the most rigorous of the practices of filial piety was connected with the same ideas. A pious son had to preserve his body intact. He does not bind himself to death by a bond of friendship. He avoids climbing to great heights. He avoids going new, near precipices. He avoids cursing or laughing incautiously. He avoids moving in the darkness. He avoids climbing up steep slopes. He fears to dishonor his parents. A sage who hurt his foot remained sad even when he was cured. This is the reason why. What makes up a man is given to him by his parents in a state of perfect wholeness. If he gives it back to them in the same state, one can say that he is a pious son. A good son does not move a foot, does not say a word without heeding the duties of filial piety. He takes the main roads and never the byways. He goes by boat and never swims. He has not the boldness to expose to danger the body he has received from his parents. End quote. Mm. Very interesting. <clears throat> Sorry about the uh, slight cough. Uh, that was some kind of some kind of cold. It's not COVID, but uh, it's annoying. Uh, but yeah, very interesting. Um, the way I understand this, as it plays out, is that there's a logic of the genus going on with this idea of the family, where there is the primordial ancestor, which is the genus as such uh, and due to the priority of the genus being the highest ontological standpoint in this position uh, everything else is derivative of that yeah uh, but as you can see uh, there is a reversal that happens precisely because of this logic as well that one is beholden to the ancestors and for that same reason, the answers are beholding to you. Yeah. Um, so there is, there is, it seems like one is very much stuck in this, Yeah. Uh, a, you know, in, in a subservient position within the family. Uh, but that position can be reversed precisely because, because you of are that necessary. dependency. Yeah. You are necessary, right? You are, you are a, a seemingly subordinated moment of this continuum descent, but at the same time, you are ne necessary. Each one of these, each one of these fibers and strands and right, are in in their in their way necessary to the continuum because the the pure genus, the abstract genus, wouldn't be a genus if it wasn't for its own descent, right? It is actually the the poorest moment, right? Yeah. The the simply po the simply potential. 
the non-differentiated unity of of genetic relationship and nothing else. You're nothing. Mm -hmm. Let's see the continuing the Xiao uh, Xiao Jing, classical filial piety, written some two thousand years ago, stated quite. <coughs> <coughs> oh, sorry, stated quite simply, quote, It is the first principle of filial piety that you dare not injure your body, limbs, hair, or skin, which you receive from your father and mother. End quote. Entering the family. Having justified the ascendancy of the family over the individual in this rather high-flown way, we can now come down to earth and look at the life cycle of the individual in the family. We shall deal first with the men, and appropriately in the Chinese context, relegate discussion of the women to second place. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> My God, he, he could have he could have done that without that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> My God. Oh, this is the yeah. case of, of the the content, like agreeing with a form, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a. Uh... Gotta gotta take the internal ethical ethical stance to critique it. <laughs> <laughs> the birth of a son was clearly of great importance to the family. Here was the means of perpetuation of the group, the best guarantee of a future existence for the parents. But the hold on life of young babies is precarious, and parents did not dare to consider the son truly alive until he was thirty days old. Only then did he receive a name. The naming was done at the feast which the parents gave to announce their good fortune to society, the feast being called the Full Month Feast. If I remember correctly, uh, the Greeks did the same, like there was only a, only after a certain time or like was a, the child considered to be yeah. uh, to be to, 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 to deserve a name, right? Yeah. We are, we are, we are not going to name <coughs> a, a child that we may not like see you again in two days, right? Yep. Sometimes he would not be given a normal name. Quote, a guest of the celebrated 11th century writer Ouyang Shi, having just learnt that one of the children in the family was called Brother Monk, expressed his astonishment. How, he said jokingly to the great scholar, how could you have given such a name to your son, you whose feelings about Buddhism are so well known? But, replied the other, laughing, is it not customary in order to protect children as they grow up to give them childhood names that are dis despicable, such as dog, sheep, or horse? End quote. <laughs> Another way of fooling malign influences was to give the boy a girl's name. Quote, <laughs> the following is the reason of such appellations. People imagine that by using a little cunning and trickery, they may succeed in deceiving the wily elves who seek to injure male children, but care little to molest girls or animals. To put them on a false track, the name of an animal or of a girl is given to the newborn male child whom one wishes to protect from their vexatious pursuits. Hearing him called by these names, they are led to believe that he is indeed a little animal or a, at most a girl, and will thus abandon the idea of cutting short his life." End quote. <laughs> Some men even grew to adulthood without losing this name. Gives a whole new meaning to a uh, what's up, dog? <laughs> what's up, bitch? <laughs> Dude called bitch. <laughs> the, the, el the elves are not interested in bitches, right? <laughs> yep. Okay. A Chinese in the course of his life could have many names, so many that scholars have devoted much time to compiling lists of the various names behind which historical characters has sheltered the confusion of posterity. For example, a man could have his milk name given to him at the full month feast, his book name given by his teacher when he started his, high, his schooling, his style, a name which he took when he was married, his other style, by which he was known to his more formal acquaintances, one or more pen names if he wrote, an official name, if he had an official rank, and probably a nickname, since the Chinese are very fond of these. Throughout all of this, only the surname remained constant. This is clearly like a material effect of the, the idea that the individual is not more important than 
his ascendancy, right? Only the surname remained constant. So his individual name could be many, could be multiple. He, he was another unified entity. He had different names to be called in different circumstances and for different purposes, right? But the surname, yeah. like, is your uh, real name, right? It's your family name. Yeah. <clears throat> Two significant points should be made here. The first is that the surname, being very much in the family sphere, was considered highly important. The Chinese contrived to make a great deal of social organization hang on the surname, as we shall see later on. And it is entirely in keeping with this that surnames were placed before personal names, so that a Chinese name was and is always given in the order Smith John Henry, and never John Henry Smith. The second point is that the major personal name which a man carried was that by which he would come to be known to posterity, his so-called posthumous name. Customs differ from place to place in China, but more often than not, this name seems to have been, in fact, the milk name. In any case, the name will have been given to the man not by himself, as happened with the La Style, for instance, nor by friends, as with the nickname, but by the family. And this important name which the individual received was often not just a name, but rather a name which fitted into a family and wider system of names and which put the man firmly in his place as a member of a particular generation. As an example, in one family of five sons which I know, a generation name, meaning to govern, has been adopted. Each of the five sons carries the word to govern as part of his personal name, and the other part consists of a compass point. Thus, the five sons are known as Wang governed the east, Wang governed the west, Wang governed the south, Wang governed the north, Wang governed the center. Luckily for his family, the Chinese cardinal points include the center, otherwise there might have been difficulty with naming the fifth son. Clearly then, under this system, the individual did not even receive his name in his own right, as it were, but only as part of the group. Even better illustrative is of the subordination of the individual in this way is the fact that often the generation names were determined many generations in advance. Not even the parents had a choice in the naming of the son. Quote, the rule to use the same code word for all sons of one generation of one family branch is widely spread, and such families usually have a poem consisting of 10, 12, 20, or 24 words, which every older member of the family knows by heart. Each word of the poem is the code word for the children of one generation. This means that if our man, Wang Ching Li, is visited by Mr. Wang, he will first try to find out whether that guest belongs to the same family. Mr. Wang Ching Li then will ask Mr. Wang for his personal name. If the name contained the code word, the host would immediately know whether the guest belonged to a generation higher than he himself. In this case, he would address him as an uncle or granduncle, even if by age he was still young, or to his own generation. In this case, he would treat him as an older or younger cousin. If there should still be a doubt, the host could ask the name of the father of the guest. The father should have the code word for the next earlier generation in his name. End quote. From the beginning, then, the individual's role as the filler of, predetermined, of, a predetermined, of a predetermined slot in the family was stressed. But what if no son were born to fill the slot? The answer was given in the previous chapter. Adoption. If at all possible, an heirless family would adopt a son, and the next best thing to a son of one's own was another fiber of the same rope, preferably a son of the husband's brother. Once adopted, this son slotted in just the same way as a son born to the family. Chinese genealogical charts abound with juggling of sons from strand to strand of the rope. Trying to keep up the descent, right? Yep. We need to keep it up. Birthdays. <clears throat> when a child was born, the exact hour, day, month, and year of birth were carefully recorded in a strand form of eight characters known as the Batsu. They were used for fortune telling and were thought to be especially important in ascertaining the likely success of a marriage, the two sets of Batsu being required to harmonize according to set rules. By contrast, birthday anniversaries generally had little significance in Chinese society. The individual might be pleased, sad, or indifferent about the fact that he has now lived for a full 12 years where yesterday he had not, but the family feels nothing. The rest of them are a day older too, and no change in relationship within the group has occurred. 
In fact, the Chinese added a year onto his age, not on his birthday, but at Chinese New Year. And since everyone else did so at the same time, there was no cause to celebrate as an individual. Quote, New Year is everybody's birthday as it is from that date that age is reckoned, regardless of the actual day the individual first saw the light. Once that morning dawns, every man, woman, and child is a year older. Part of the celebrations of the festival consists in firing crackers in honor of the domestic animals and grains on which man depends for subsistence. The first of the year is the birthday of the chickens, the second of the dogs, third pigs, fourth ducks, fifth oxen, sixth horses, whilst on the seventh there is a universal birthday of mankind. It is lucky to visit relations on the horse's birthday, but on the universal day of mankind, one should stay at home and eat red beans to the number of seven for a man and fourteen for a woman. End quote. Seventh day for humanity. Interesting. <coughs> this practice could lead to some rather odd results. A Chinese was considered to be one Shui, old when born. If he were born on the last day of the year, he added a year to his age the next day, so that he was two shui old, his western counterpart being only one day old. To complicate the reckoning of the Chinese lunar year could have as few as 354 days, so that it was possible for a Chinese age calculated in shui to differ by as much as three from age calculated as completed years of life as in the western system. There was once a celebration of something akin to our own moribund Coming of age, boys were capped at the age of 20 and girls went through a ceremonial putting in of hairpins at 15, but in recent centuries the ceremony survived only as a minor ritual incorporated into the immediate preparations for marriage. For the young at least, for the young at least birthdays were of no great moment, and this points again to the playing down of the individual vis-a-vis -vis the family. Betrothal and Marriage After the full month feast, the next important ceremonies for the individual were in fact betrothal and marriage. Here again it was the family which controlled the individual, for marriage was arranged for the individual, not left to his own free choice, dependent on the vagaries of love. <coughs> it was the parents, grandparents, or perhaps maternal uncles of the man who decided when he should get married and to whom. Frequently, he was not consulted at all, and might only be informed of his impending marriage shortly before it took place and after the arrangements had been made. The hero of the Dream of the Red Chamber was put through a marriage ceremony by his family, and only discovered that it was not to the girl his choice that he was wed when it came to the unveiling after the ceremony. Many men had not even seen their bride until the wedding was over. Quote, Critics of China condemn the custom of keeping the couple apart until after the wedding. They charge that this ignorance of one another is the cause of many marital failures and tragedies, and without love no marriage can be successful. According to the writer's careful observation, this is only partially true. The young couple's lack of knowledge of one another may make an early adjustment difficult, but it does not prevent successful marriage. When a husband and wife have worked together, raised children together, tried to build up the prosperity of the family, shared happiness and sorrow, they feel that they have had a successful marriage, be it romantic or not. A marriage based on mutual attraction between young people of different standards and ways of thought often calls for greater mutual adaption than in the case of traditional Chinese marriage, which is arranged by the parents but in which the parties concerned know exactly what is expected of them and have similar traditions and ambitions." End quote. I think the critics of China were not only criticizing this custom because it, it, it was not successful, right? I think there are many other reasons for the critique, but yeah. This reminds me of, <laughs> you remember that uh, <laughs> Irami, Irami made an argument that he thought that uh, he was okay with uh, the idea of arranged marriage. Because uh, <laughs> uh, he thought that uh, for this exact reason, actually, the, the one that it's mentioned here, that in an arranged yeah. marriage, all of the stress of dating and of have I chosen the right person, do I really love this person, whatever, is God. You know exactly what you're getting into, and you know exactly yeah. why. And all yeah. there is is just making it work. You know, just do your part, they do their part, and that's it. Don't worry about love or anything, it's just everybody knows exactly where they're at. Yeah. And, uh, 
I have to say I, I agree with IRB. It's like it's not that this should be the norm, but, but that this does not seem I, unacceptable if you are okay with it. I mean, like the context. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like if, if if it is consented, <laughs> I mean. But I think the context he was talking about that uh, was he is always criticizing the idea that marriage should be based on on love or even in anything else but the will to form a certain familiar unity of co codependence and and co-determination right because the main idea is that if you base your family your project of a family <coughs> in love this project is not free because it is it is determined by by the fleeting uh, movements of, of of sentimentality of love right so in the moment that your partner or yourself are not in love anymore well the family is over right yeah. and Arami says that that produces a lot of fear and like, anxiety and because he thinks that anxiety and fear usually are good signs of unfreedom right but he also extends that to the uh, to to a critique of the contract uh, like family as a contract in which like two people find themselves before each other as as exchanging services right the problem is that these determinations of of being able this determination of being able to provide a service may be taken out of you and then well you are not fulfilling the conditions of the contract the, the marriage can be over right and sometimes these these the these conditions are very much based on physical appearance for instance for instance there are many women who are very worried about getting older because they 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 actually they, they at, at least they feel that their relationship can be over because they cannot fulfill the condition of being young and beautiful anymore right yeah so I, I really think that even though I don't agree with, 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 with these traditional conventions ways of arranging marriage, I do think that they have their reason, right? And in many circumstances, they do solve some problems that our liberal marriage is not able to solve. Uh, yeah. I agree. Continuing. Once more, given the emphasis on family importance, it is fitting that the individual should not be allowed to choose his mate. Free choice would imply a strong partiality of the husband for his wife, and this would mean that sex considerations might impinge on generation and age considerations, resulting in the individual giving weight to the wrong relationship as far as the family was concerned. How much better for the family to select the bride? The husband then was, likely, was less likely to get his priorities wrong. No matter what, oh. uh, sorry. No so, matter so that. The, I, I, sorry, sorry. They, I, I didn't understand this part. He, he he's basically saying that if the man should choose, there would be a, a a a higher chance that he would be subordinated by his wife. That it, and sex um. and generation and age considerations <laughs> would flip and switch. Yeah, apparently, uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, I would say that's it, that if you, if you're way too attracted to your wife, you know, like too crazy for your wife, uh, you might just throw all these other thing considerations of the family to the wayside. Yeah. Uh, which I certainly see, uh, does happen. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's see. Um, uh, how much better it's for the family better. to select? Yeah. How much better for the family to select the bride? The husband then was less likely to get his priorities wrong. No matter that the husband found that he did not like his wife much, he and she were there to continue the family, not to like each other. In a very real sense, the husband and wife tie was not one of affection, though affection could and often did arise between them, but of duty. The family required a daughter-in-law in order to continue the line and in order to help out with the household chores. If in the process the family could forge a link with another family of influence or wealth or other attractions, so much of the better. A young man would not necessarily have the judgment to choose the appropriate spouse for the family. 
let the experienced family head do it for him. Three examples of the role of the family in a marriage should suffice to drive home the point we are making. The first is that, since individual choice was not allowed, there was no need for the family to wait until a son was of marriageable age before selecting a spouse for him. In some cases, betrothals were made even before the birth of the couple, two families agreeing that, w that should one have a son and the other a daughter, they would be betrothed and eventually married. The following case is not so extreme, but clearly takes no account of the desires of the individuals. Quote, as soon as the son was born, the family began to think about his betrothal, which could be contracted as soon as the child had passed its first New Year's Day. Marriage contracts were seldom confirmed before a boy was five. However, and most betrothals occurred at the age of 10 or 11, by which time it was expected that such matters would be settled. The mother and father discussed the problem, reviewing all the families in neighboring villages with unmarried daughters, fitting the prescribed rules of preference. In any event, the qualifications of family were primary and those of the, the individuals secondary. End quote. The second example deals not with betrothal, but with the wedding ceremony, ceremony itself. In the West, the ceremony is witnessed by the church and or state, but in traditional China, the wedding took place in the home of the groom, and a major part of the ceremony consisted of the worship by the couple of the groom's ancestors and the offering of food and drink to the elders of his family. Quote, the bridal pair are conducted to the ancestral hall where they prostrate themselves before the altar on which the ancestral tablets are arranged. Heaven and earth and the gods of the principal doors of the house and the parents of the bridegroom are the next objects of their worship. A further act of homage, which consists in pouring out the drink offerings to the ancestors of the family, having been duly performed by the bridegroom only, the happy couple are escorted to the bridal chamber. End quote. The third example points most clearly to the relative unimportance of the individual. It happened from time to time, of course, that a son died while betrothed but yet unmarried. In such cases, it was possible for the family to perform a ghost marriage, wedding the fiancé to the spirit of the dead son, thereby securing for the family the services of the bride to help in the house, and at the same time, making it possible for the bride to adopt the son and bring him up to continue the family line, just as would have happened perhaps if her prospective husband had lived. My God, that's the, the, the most bizarre. <laughs> like, by far, until now. <laughs> Yeah. I think uh, this shows like a, in the philosophy of history Hegel talks about how uh, China is like a, a spirit of like a supreme understanding like supremely formal uh, yeah like it, it's not even about the specific content that they care about it's just so long as the form is maintained yeah. the specific content does not matter so the so family long, has nothing so long as, as these these external positive norms could could be could be could be reaching even the most minimal details of the individual lives so it is right so that yeah. there are a lot of codes to everything like the most un unimportant action for a westerner could be it could be coded within a certain conventional framework in China, right? Yep. So you know, here the family, the ideal is yeah, you know, to unify the form and the content. But if the content is gone, so long as the form it suffices, you know. So the family yeah. has nothing. The family in reality has nothing to do with blood. Yeah. The desire to have a pr the yeah, the desire to have practical support for the parents in their old age was probably as much a factor in this arrangement as was the need for provision of spiritual and ancestral comforts for the son. The son's place at the wedding ceremony was taken by his ancestor tablet or by a white cockerel. The this latter substitute could also be used when a living but absent son took a bride, a fairly common procedure in emigrant areas of China. Concubinage was one answer to the problem of barrenness in a wife. For the wealthy, it was often a status symbol. For the poor, it was usually an economic impossibility. For those strapped in an inimical arranged marriage, it could be an escape. A man could have as many concubines as he could afford, desire, or tolerate. 
and he could choose them himself. Quote, Mr. Lin did not hesitate to admit true love for his first concubine, whom, it is said, he took with the approval of both his own and his wife's family in a ceremony which did not differ from that of his first marriage, except that the concubine had to serve tea to his wife. He had paid a great deal of rice for the girl, who was sixteen. The two women, at least in the beginning, had different rooms in the same house and were friendly. Asked if they ever fought, he answered, How could they? They had too much to do in order to eat and clothe themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lin pointed out that in the place where he lived, many men had concubines without suffering from domestic troubles, while in the other cases the wives were always slapping newcomers. Asked what would happen if a concubine slapped a wife, he said that he did not think that would happen. But if she did, people would not like it. Oh, would like not it. like it. <laughs> what I find interesting that I bet many of these wives were actually like tranquilized by, by the concubine you know like that disgusting motherfucker is having sex with that bitch I don't need to you know what I mean like <laughs> yeah thank god he have a concubine uh, it took too many too, too much time for him to, to get one you know let me talk about the division of uh it's not just the division of internal family labor, but also the division of uh, emotional labor. Yeah, yeah. Like, I bet that those wives who were slapping the concubines actually liked their husbands, right? Actually cared about them, in a sense, cared about their time and, and attention, and felt that they were being betrayed, right? Yeah, yeah. Um... Certainly, uh, I think it, it gets discussed later on how, uh, uh, though the concubine is lesser than the wife, uh, there were ways in which the concubine, uh, if she was uh, the one that the husband really liked, uh, she could get some perks and uh, that the yeah. wife yeah. could not. It's, it's interesting to see here the the, the <clears throat> like the, how the logical move of of taking the genus as itself and as an absolute has this consequence of creating two 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 women right there are two women there there is one which is uh, which results like in its particularity it's resulted by the decision of the genus right which is the wife and there is another which is like decided by the will of the and the material possibilities too which are which is a uh, which are conditions for it, but there is room for choice, and 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 the woman of choice is the concubine, right? Yep. Like uh, you cannot unify both. So there is sex in the concubine. There is reproduction in wife. There is uh, uh, love and carelessness uh, to the concubine, and there is practical activities to maintain the the, the continuing descent with the wife. Mm-hmm. Both custom and law require that the first wife be treated as superior to a concubine. Quote, he who degrades his wife to the position of a concubine shall be liable to 100 strokes. He who raises his concubine to the position of wife while the wife is alive shall be liable to 90 strokes. End quote. Most concubines were taken with less ceremony than Mr. Lin's in the above example, though it was normal for there to be some form of symbolic difference to the wife, such as the offering of tea, or in one area, crawling through the wife's straddled legs. What? Concubines, what? what? I did... uh, so you know, like the wife... Straddled legs. Straddled, uh, like, you know, like, uh, like your, your legs spread apart, so like the wife is like standing okay. with her legs spread apart, and the concubine has to crawl under. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> okay. Concubines were protected by incest law from abuse by other males of the family, and their position was legally regularized in other ways too. By custom, the sons of a concubine usually had the same equal rights of inheritance with the sons of a wife. They were expected to treat the wife as a mother, and she could expect their ritual services after her death. For this reason, and because hostility on her part might anger her husband to the point of repudiating her, a barren wife might actively welcome her husband's taking of a concubine. 
We might note in passing that resort to prostitutes was another means of escape from an inimical marriage. It was neither uncommon nor considered particularly reprehensible, especially in and near large towns or cities. Quote, if reproduction is confined to the family, the same is not so generally true of sexual satisfaction. A large number of the young men of my, of my acquaintance, including gentlemen, young clerks, and merchants, had experienced sexual intercourse before marriage. Some of them, though married, occasionally visited prostitutes when traveling to Nanking or Shanghai. There was one man who had been a married gentleman with a local reputation as a poet and smoker of opium. His nephew relates that upon the death of his wife, this man had been plunged into utter melancholy which threatened to see him waste away. The father of my informant acted as a go-between and went to Chuenchao, a nearby county seat, where he arranged for the service of a professional prostitute. The melancholy man was taken to Chuenchao, where he lived with the girl for a short time. The affair was paid for by a coalition of friends and relatives, and a swift recovery was said to have been achieved. End quote. <laughs> <I've> got... <laughs> <clears throat> it's quite the cure for That's depression. The interesting thing of, of being a human being, we are able to laugh at, at my God, at the customs of, of old China, you know. <laughs> the aged and the family head. As he got older and his seniors died off, so the man gradually became more and more powerful in the family. It was in the later years of his life that the individual might begin to celebrate his birthday, particularly at certain ages, with local custom decreed, well, which local custom decreed were more important. In general, these ages seem to have been 51, 61, 71, and 81. But for the man who had attained a position such as family head, that is a senior male by generation and age in the family, each birthday might well be the occasion of family ceremonial. Again, the point should be made that such a man was important by virtue of his position, and not really in his own right as an individual. The family head had a great deal of power over the other members of the group. Quote, the father or senior male ascendant has control over his sons, his grandsons and their wives, as well as over hired servants and slaves. Municipal law does not greatly concern itself with what takes place within the domestic forum or family group. The head has certain discretionary powers, and unless these powers are grossly abused, it will not interfere. In the father is vested all the family property, and he alone can dispose of it. End quote. All right, give me a second. I'm going to get some water. Of course, the family head did not own the family property. It was not his own. It was not his to own. It belonged to the family and he was merely chief trustee. Despite this, the author of the book from which the above is quoted goes on to point out that, quote, There appears to be practically no limit to the extent to which a man may dispose of or squander his property during his lifetime. In this, there is a logical inconsistency. In the Roman law, where, as here, the head of the family was considered as forming in some sort with those under him an undivided unity, owning the property in common. The next of kin could, by imposing a curator, restrain a prodigal or spendthrift from wasting his patrimony. End quote. The inconsistency surely lies in the fact that the basis of family order, the generation and age sex hierarchy, worked to give the family head virtually absolute power, a power reinforced by the law. But the sanctions which restrained that power were almost entirely confined to the religious sphere without secular backing. We shall be looking at the religious aspect of the family in due course, but we should meanwhile not be misled into thinking that because there was no secular power to restrain them, large numbers of family heads were prodigals. Uh, 
In any case, there was one natural factor which exerted an opposing force to the power of the family head, and that was his surrendering to the advance of age. The older he became, the less physically capable he was, and physical superiority gradually passed to his son or sons. Lip service to the authority of old age was always paid, but in practice much moral authority tended to follow in the footprints of physical strength, particularly in that majority of families which were engaged in agriculture. Quote, <clears throat> Quote, the father's authority in the fields, now that he does not work there, is considerably lessened. He had lost his role in business transactions because he is too old to take the farm products to the market town and deal directly with the dealers. To a certain extent, his importance in relations with the neighbors is diminished because people find that he is no longer the real authority and that his position as family head is more nominal than real, although he is still respected by all the household. His wife must see to it that he is well fed, well clothed, and well cared for. He preserves also the privilege of venting his anger upon any member of the family, except his daughters-in-law. Nevertheless, he sometimes recognizes his real position. Care of the aged was the responsibility of their sons. When the family property was divided equally among the sons, a portion was set aside for supporting the aged parents. This was the custom of Yang Lao Chi, oh, Yang La, Yang Lao De, land of the aged. If the household land head had died, land to support the aged. Oh, no. land to support the aged. Yeah, thank you. If the household head had died and only his widow survived, land amounting to two or five mo, as sometimes as much as ten mo, was so provided. This land could be leased to other peasants, but the rent was used to support the aged parent. This land was not to be mortgaged or sold until both parents died, and only then was it to be sold or to pay for funeral expenses. Any remaining land was divided between the sons. If the land was not leased while the parents lived, one of the sons farmed it and divided the produce between the sons caring for the aged couple. End quote. Death. The Chinese recognize three great events in the life of the individual. His birth, his marriage, and his death. We have seen how closely interested in birth and marriage the family was. It was no less so with death. The deceased was briefly remembered as an individual, but in the funeral and mourning the accent was on the family and its continuance. His funeral was made the occasion for a display of family wealth and strength. Quote, Poverty and death are haunting specters of the poor. They roam through the village and inspire fear that is not physical, but social. It is not that the villager fears death, his belief in fate relieves him of that worry. But to think of his parent drawing near to the time of departure without adequate funds for proper rites and burial, this is a real fear. To fail in the, priv to fail in the provision of rites, feasts, coffin, and funeral would be, con would be conduct... Uh, okay, that's just a weird sentence. Uh, to fail in the provision of rites, feasts, coffin, and funeral would uh, be conduct to the most uh, unfilial the, yeah, yeah. yeah to the most unfilial and condemned by social opinion the family would be disgraced and the prestige of the village lowered in the estimation of the regional community so far as gossip would extend on the matter end quote <laughs> interesting the dead were buried near their homes either in wasteland or where there was none in the fields the quick destruction of human corpses, having since very ancient times been odious to the Chinese as imperiling the happiness and safety of the living, while their preservation in the ground was always esteemed by them as the highest duty prescribed by filial piety, it must appear a strange thing that the very same people has for many centuries much practiced cremation. Cremation was in the first place largely practiced by the Buddhist monkhood, from which it passed over to the laity, assuming for a long time considerable proportions. But in a subsequent period of general abatement of the influence of the church, cremation fell a prey to the general odium, so that at the present day it hardly occurs anywhere except within the pales of Buddhist monastic life. End quote. As far as length of mourning time and degree of mourning dress worn were concerned, these depended on the degree of relationship which the survivors had with the head, not on the degree of affection which they bore him. He made no will 
for he had no property of his own to bequeath. Of course, there was a personal, sentimental side to the remembrance of the dead, just as there was in the treatment of the living, but the dead man was also something of a cipher, an ancestor, to be used by the family as a ritual prop, a religious symbol reinforcing family unity. His place in the family was filled by another. The razor had moved along the rope to another fiber. The woman and the family. The general remarks we may have we have made about the life of the male vis-a-vis -vis his family do not hold good for the female. She started life at a disadvantage and received quite different treatment throughout it. For comparison, we shall match topic for topic her life with that already given for the male. Her birth was attended by little of the rejoicing which surrounded that of a son. There was a greater chance of her being killed at birth than the son, though we should avoid exaggerating the incidents of infanticide and a much greater risk of being sold out of the family. She was unlikely to be wanted in adoption, and she was unlikely to be honored with a full month feast. A girl had no pro proliferation of names. Her milk name sufficed. When she married, she tended to lose even that, for she was generally known by her husband's surname, or more formally by her own surname prefixed by her husband's, or by a kinship term which placed her firmly in a family-determined slot, or even in due course by such a name as mother of, whatever son's name was. Her one claim to individuality might be a nickname. Tough. Yeah. You don't even get to have a name. Jeez. Yeah. And and when she has, it's her milk name. That name that they gave them, gave her, like, when she was, like, a child who would po probably not survive, right? Mm-hmm. Her parents might well bring her up with some reluctance. In the southeast of China, for instance, the Cantonese and Hokkien's refer to their daughters as goods on which one loses one's capital, the point being that it costs money and effort to raise and train a girl only for all the investment to be handed over to her husband's family when she married. The girl began to share in the household work and baby-minding responsibilities at a very young age, while her brothers were allowed a much longer, much freer childhood. The boy went to school if he were fortunate, but girls rarely had such an opportunity, and were for the most part condemned to illiteracy. The whole training of a daughter by her family was aimed at fitting her to be a wife, mother, and worker for another family. Quote, Many girls were subjected to foot binding. The foot became so compressed that the woman usually hobbled about with difficulty or had to learn, had to lean on a wall, cane, or another person for support. One result of this virtual crippling, especially severe among upper-class ladies, was to confine women to the boudoir. They were thus physically prevented from moving about freely and unchaperoned and were rendered immune from the social disease of conjugal infidelity. Wow, another, reason, yeah, another reason why this custom survived the vicissitudes of a millennium of history was its profound appeal to the Chinese male. The sexual appeal of foot-binding to the Chinese male was never questioned. Those in favor of abolition contend, condemned the tiny foot as lewd and lascivious because it led man astray and prevented him from fulfilling his social responsibilities. End quote. <laughs> yeah, boy, that's uh, it's pretty uncaring towards women. I mean, like, oh, well, you know, we should get rid of foot binding, not because it cripples them, but because it makes men too horny. And, oh, but, but there is also the possibility that the fact that women who had their feet binded, they were they they were considered to be less free, right? And that could arouse men in China. I don't know. Like she cannot walk easily as as other women can, so maybe she is rendered immune from the social disease of conjugal infidelity, right? Mm -hmm. Or things like that. It's, it's it's fucked up. Not all women had bound feet, and there were degrees of severity of binding, but the practice emphasized the dependent status of the female. With regard to marriage, the girl was just as much a pawn in the hands of her family as was the man. The following extract is translated from a Chinese account of marriage customs in a district of southeastern China. Quote, However, one month before she leaves her natal home, the bride's family go through the ceremony called 
knowing the day. This is because her wedding is something completely outside the bride's control. It is her parents who decide on it, and she has been kept in utter ignorance of it. Now, when the time to be married out of her home is near at hand, she may be deceived no longer, and it is only when she is formally acquainted with the fact that she becomes aware that she is about to be married out as someone's wife. From the moment of her telling on, her freedom of movement is limited, and her rising and living, drinking and eating, sitting, sleeping, and working all are confined to one place, usually upstairs in the house. End quote. But in marriage, the girl had much more at stake than the man. Where a man's life had three great events, there was one greatest event for a woman, her wedding. The man, after all, usually remained with his own family. It was the woman who was cut loose from her natal surroundings and plunged into a completely strange family in which she knew no one. Seated in an enclosed sedan chair, she was carried weeping to her new home. The weeping was customary, as often were the obscene songs which she sang about the unknown family into which she was being married, but grief, fear, and anxiety doubtless had as much to do with equality for performance as did custom. Since the man had little or no say in the choice of his bride, it had often been comment commented that it was his family and not he who married her. Thus, quote, A man in China does not marry so much for his own benefit as for that of the family, to continue the family name, to provide descendants to keep up the ancestral worship, and to give a daughter-in-law to his mother and wait on her, to wait on her and be, in general, a daughter to her, end quote. What he has said so far goes a long way towards a backing this interpretation. A preoccupation with the mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationship is observable in many of the Western books which have touched on Chinese family life. It should now be apparent why. The husband-wife relationship was placed low on the scale of priorities, while the parent-child relationship was considered very important. Given a cultural situation where there was expected to be little communication between the sexes, it falls that the parent-child relationship affecting the daughter-in-law most in everyday life was going to be that of her mother-in-law. Often this seemed to have resulted in a tyranny of the older woman over the younger. Quote, in some parts of China, it was preferred for the son to become betrothed to his mother's brother's daughter. In fact, the betrothal was almost compulsory in Kaoyao if a boy had a maternal cousin no more than three years younger, and it could be arranged if the girl was older. End quote. Hmm. So, uh, so uh, marrying the first cousin, then, yeah, mother's brother's daughter, yeah, marrying the first cousin. <coughs> it has been suggested that this form of first cousin marriage, shown diagrammatically in Figure Five, worked to make less unpleasant the relationship between bride and mother-in-law. Because the two women the two. would have, yeah, because the two women would have come from the same background, would be already related to each other, and would almost certainly have known each other before the marriage. Be that as it may, it was not a universal preference, and the majority of brides would not have been chosen in this way. The tyrannous aspect of this relationship could be explained in a number of ways. In terms of necessity to break the newcomer to the ways of her new home, in terms of a revenge for her own lifelong subjection taken on the part of the older woman against the one adult person over whom she was given much power, or in terms of the result of rivalry for the affections of the son. End quote. Uh, quote. The relationship between mother and son is comparatively close. The affection between mother and son is threatened when the son marries. If the mother is selfish or narrow-minded, as many mothers are, she will become jealous of the young wife. Not a few of the difficulties between mother-in-law and daughter-in-law are unconsciously based on such jealousy. End quote. Pretty Freudian, one might say. <laughs> if, we, if we take in consideration the relationship and the, the three priorities, like this, this woman, the, the, like the only person that over which she could yield authority was her daughter-in-law right that that's the only form of direct authority that she has yeah she, she has no, in many aspects she has no authority even over her her own son right yep 
Yeah, so I mean, uh, the Freudian joke is just that it's a Freudian joke. Like, like, I don't think like this is a Freudian uh, issue because it, it's more of a power issue. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like a mother, a mother wants to have a close relationship with a son because she knows the son is going to become the patriarch or the family eventually. You know, the better her relationship with the yeah. son, the more power she has. Uh, but if the son likes his wife a bit too much, uh, the wife can have power over the mother uh, through the son. So that would definitely cause uh, family friction. The necessity to, br to break the bride to her new life was avoided in one form of marriage, which again illustrates the degree of family control over the fate of the individual. In this form, a young girl or girl baby would be purchased by a family who would raise her themselves and eventually marry her to one of their own sons. This procedure seems generally to have been despised, perhaps not least because it was associated with a considerable divorce rate. It was commonplace in some periods of Chinese history, however, that it, when recent research on Taiwan was show, has shown that it was quite common there, quote, for both the men's family and the woman's uterine family, the simpua form of marriage had real advantages over other marriage types. The cost of raising a child, often a child who replaced one born to the family, was not comparable to the ruinous expense of bride price, engagements, cakes, and feasts required by the major marriage. When the couple were old enough to marry, their, bow, their bow to the ancestors need only be acknowledged by a simple family feast. Both wealthy and poor families saw advantages in the simpua form of marriage beyond those of economy. They valued the safety of having a daughter for a daughter-in-law. No outsider had to be brought into the heart of the family. The family did not need to depend on the word of a go-between and the dubious judgments of the relatives about the character, honesty, industry, health, and good nature of the woman who was, was to spend the rest of her life in their house and take care of them in their old age. End quote. I assume that the reason why there was a high divorce rate is uh, people you grow up with are not people you generally are att sexually attracted to. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, this person gets brought into the family like as a, literally a baby or, you know, very close to early age along with the son. Uh, they would grow up like siblings. So, of course, it would just be fucking weird. While on the subject of despised practices, we should note that there was an exception to the rule whereby the wife was married into her husband's family. The reverse could take place, usually where a family had only daughters and not sons, when a son-in-law might be married in, in in order to continue the family line. In such a case, the son-in-law, Chuefe, agreed to allow the first son of the marriage to take his wife's surname, the wife thus functioning for descent purposes in her own family very much as though she had been a male. Often in these cases, the Chuefa reserved the right to bring up a second son to his own surname, and so the two families would emerge, each with the same parents but with different surnames. Again, this gives an indication of the importance of family continuance. I lost my page. The position of a wife in her husband's family was theoretically a very insecure one. Legally, under the so-called seven outs, she could be divorced, that is, outed from the family for the following reasons. 1. Barrenness. 2. Wanton conduct. 3. Neglect of parents-in-law. 4. Garelessness. 5. Theft. 6. Jealousy and ill will. 7. Incurable disease. Ooh, that suck. That really puts like the, the whole... Uh, the freedom of marriage was not something that the wife had a right to. Uh, you know, not so the, whole, the whole point of marriage is like, you know, if anything happens, like, you know, you like have the rights could, of family. <laughs> yeah, if they could, they would cut a finger and let a, 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 a son be born out of that. Like, the woman was a drag, right? That like, okay, we need reproduction. In last instance, we need reproduction, so we need women. But apart from that, they have nothing. They're only kept alive and well-fed and well-secured because they're able to reproduce. 
Like, come on, you yeah. could be outed of a family by for, for being annoying, you know. <laughs> yep, or you know, you get an incurable disease. Like, what the fuck? And imagine that that woman would be condemned, right? Like, imagine, a, like, if the gossips were told that he was such an annoying person that the the last man she was with couldn't bear him, and they they outed her from the family. You know, who would want to marry that woman again? Yeah, which is, uh, you know, whether it was true or not, you know, just all, all it would have to be that oh, the family would have to just kind of come together yeah. and. Uh, Agree to take her to court over that and uh, keep their story yeah. coherent, and that would be it. Um, in return, she was protected only by the three not outs, which ruled that she could not be divorced if one, she had kept the three years mourning for either of her parents in law, two, her husband's family had become wealthy after she was married into it, three, she had no home to return to. Okay. Barrenness was one of the worst fears of the young wife, and her marriage was in a certain amount of danger until she had born a son. After all, like neglect of parents-in-law, barrenness offended against the family. Quote, Mencius said, There are three ways of being a bad son. The most serious is to have no heir. End quote. Despite legal prohibitions, the sale and pawning of wives sometimes occurred. Quote, More especially pawning occurred on the grand scale in the provinces of Hunan, Chekiang, Qiangzi, and Anhui. It was to be found in the lower and the middle classes of society, and even married women having children were pawned. Poverty is given as the reason for this custom contrary to the law and Chinese moral teaching. But at least one man sold his wife because he was very angry with her for going so often to her own family. End quote. With the harsh treatment which wives could receive, we might expect many of them to have wished for divorce, but even if they did so desire, there was nothing that they could do. Quote, it was considered improper and unwomanly for a wife to repudiate her husband. If she left his home of her own free will, she was guilty of having run away and punished accordingly. In Tang and Sung, by two years imprisonment, in Ming and Ching, it was by one hundred strokes in the provision that her husband could sell her in ma marriage. If she married before she returned to her deserted husband's home, she was sentenced to three years imprisonment under Tang and Sung law, and detention in prison for strangling under Ming and Ching law. Oh shit. <clears throat> in any case, a divorced woman could be hard put to it to survive. Her own family would be unlikely to welcome her back, and there was much disapproval of remarriage for women, though it was quite in order for men to remarry. Her options were all unpleasant, and extended little further than a choice between suicide, begging, prostitution, and becoming a nun. On the part of the husband's family, however, there were moral, if not legal, sanctions to be reckoned with, and the combined weight of public disapproval of divorce and of possible pressure from the wife's family probably were sufficient to make divorcing her unthinkable. In practice, divorce was very rare. Even concubines, who mostly did not go through a full wedding ceremony, seem seldom to have been cast aside. With the birth of a son, a wife was in a much stronger position in her husband's family. She was now fully connected to it through her son, and she got older and came to a senior position in the family, so her influence grew. In the home, at least, she was in control. Even when her husband died and she supposedly came under the authority of her sons, her age and the re her relationship with her sons often enabled her to hold sway. If she were senior in generation and age in the family, she would almost certainly be treated as the family head. Her sons would defer to her in mo on most matters, and especially so in the domestic sphere. Old age then gave a woman at last a measure of equality with a man. However, her strength even then derived through the family system in her having sons. Without sons, she was doomed to powerlessness and eventually to extinction, for if she had no sons, she could not be an act ancestress, and if she could not be an ancestress, it meant that her soul would have no means of support when she died. With sons, her importance to the family was established, her existence after death was assured, and she became as immortal as did her husband. This look at the individual in the family has been, in some ways, a biased one. 
We have tried to bring out clearly the basic differences in the emphasis of, on a family importance between the traditional Chinese family and the family we know in the West. To do so, we have picked out those aspects of family life which seem to show the difference most pointedly, and the result is a picture of automaton figures dancing in patterns set by the family. Obviously, Chinese people were not and are not automatons, so that in accepting what has been said above as a guideline to the Chinese family system, we must make allowance for a great deal of difference in practice between families and a variation under the influence of individual personalities. This heavy-handedness of the family and its control over the individual would surely not have continued if there were not, be if there were not benefit accruing to the individual from submission to it. The family, in fact, repay the individual for his subjection in many ways, a convenient umbrella word for which might be security. With the accent on continuance of membership, property, and religion, the family achieved a stability on which the individual could rely right through his life. His own loyalty to the family and to his elders within it was returned by the support of the family both while he was young and when he was aged and dependent. Relationships within the group may have been difficult as personality struggled with duty, but the family offered a sure source of help and comfort and a lasting refuge from a most uncertain outside world. All right, that's uh, chapter two. Yeah, very historically interesting. Yeah. I think one of the conditions for us to really understand what is at stake in modernity is to have a clear picture of what ancient societies were like, right? Because nowadays I I I sometimes see people who actually have a very romantic uh, vision of the past, right? They think that the past was yep. this uh, ethical, substantial unity between people and things were clearer and we respected nature more and we had more fulfilling lives and stuff like that. Okay, uh, that may be in certain aspects true, but there is also the fact that the individual was not a thing in the past, right? And yep. there was no such a thing as as a right to consciousness, for example, a right to be able to to see uh, outer rules as if they are also uh, inner demands of a rational individual, right? So, and many people take that so much for granted that they are not not able to actually see what modernity actually brought to us, you know? So th these kinds of uh, uh, intercourses in the history of ancient societies uh, are always very interesting to me because that remind me the importance of, of some modernity principles which I think are universal and from now on, from their emergency history, eternal in a certain sense, right? And, and truth. Uh, yeah, uh, I totally agree with that. Uh, people do not understand uh, until they encounter these things that humanity really has changed in an immense amount and that culture is extremely important for the very possibility of conceiving certain things which we take for granted. Yeah, uh, The idea of yeah. modern individuality just literally did not exist for a long, yeah. long time. Yeah, the, the people recognized that people could choose, right? But choice was not a right in any circumstances. Most of the time, there was a certain field of choice that was liberated for in, the individual, for male individuals, right? But apart from that, mm -hmm. choice and consent and a formal process of of decision which would take everybody into account equally were not something to be seen. These are cultures of content in a sense, not in the sense that form is is not important, but there was there is no such a thing as 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 a form of argumentation which which surpasses the 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 traditional justification, right? Why this is right? This is right because this has been done 
for ages, my friend. Your reason pales before the effectiveness and the perennity of our customs, right? Yeah, um, not only that, so, it, was just, it, it was just a given natural order. Like, it just was. Yeah. yeah, apart from that, yeah, there is this idea that all these practices, they were believed to be uh, the emergence of certain cosmological conditions, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so the custom was not as artificial as we think they are today, right, at that time. Customs were actually like the attempt to to realize in the moral order the organization of the the world itself, right? Yeah, uh, I think one of the best things uh, in which like this is more clear than anything, uh, particularly in uh, Hegel's works, is the his philosophy of religion. Uh, in yes. Which, yes. Uh, because uh, funny enough, like the philosophy of religion is just a, a far more abstract yet essential form of the philosophy of history in which the philosophy of religion is just the generalized self-conception of man as the absolute uh, through the yeah. image of God. And yeah, uh, yeah. you can see in, in Hegel's argument there is that in the development of religion historically, you can see uh, that God is a reflection of what we think ourselves to be. So yes, if God yes. does not, if God does not have free will, we don't believe ourselves to have free will. If God is just yes. a force of nature, we see ourselves as a force of nature. Uh, yeah, and yeah. therefore, you can clearly see here, like the basic, the basic uh, logic of valuing. Right? You need a criteria. You need a certain ideal or a certain idea of perfection and. And, and highness in a sense so you can rate empirical things right and then the concept of god is usually used to as a as a, as a term of comparison right we literally tried throughout history to to be god in a sense in the sense that we were striving to to realize a certain conception of divinity in the real world right uh, yeah, uh, so, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, that, that that's one of the reasons that I think that Marxists, for example, they 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 are so mistaken about religion, and they usually approach religion either with contempt or with that condescendent uh, tolerance, you know, and they don't understand that if you were messing around with someone's conception of God. You are actually messing around with the the, the the idea that the person, the highest idea that the person can conceive about, like itself, right, and self, and about the world, right. And this is not easy yeah. stuff. This is not like this is not light. You know, when we speak about religion, you must be very careful because there are people who still believe, right. There are people who still yep. believe, and for them. Well, for them, if you mess up with their highest representation, you are basically destroying them from from top to bottom, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that the most interesting comes uh, the most interesting thing that comes about is that uh, people don't understand. Like, like I said, like people don't understand that what we have now like as our given subjectivity like oh well freedom of speech freedom of choice uh, you know you make life whatever it is that you want you know so determine yourself this was inconceivable in the past it just wasn't Not something people God could was yeah. was was able to do that right yeah you know uh, in greek society uh, fate dominated even the gods were subject to even fate the gods yeah yeah, not even the gods were were free. In a sense, you know, and uh, and this is one of the things that people don't understand. That um, and I do, I do agree with Hegel here that Christianity was an abs a historically unique thing. That I know no. that uh, where individuality came to such a concretion like never before. Uh, where the individual finally really mattered metaphysically and the very idea yeah. of 
yeah. of yeah. of choice, and, the very idea of free will, the, all these things it, of conscience. Yeah, and and it, what is interesting is that people usually try to reduce Christianity to to an, to other religions, right? And say, oh, there is this Egypt story about a god that was born and stuff. But I think I think what people can't understand is that what is new in Christianity is the idea of first of of a certain theology in which everybody, irrespective of their position on earth, are equal before the eyes of the divinity. And also the idea that this God is not obliging you to do anything, right? He's saying, well, if you think about me, you are going to find your way. But you can, you don't need to, right? It, it, it is a God that, that literally opens the door to evil, right? You can be evil. And that, that, yeah. that, 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 that is made explicit by this God himself, right? So it's not a matter of being born. I think it's important, the idea of the descendants from the abstract unity uh, of the monotheistic God to, to the concrete uh, multiplicity of of Jesus Christ, right? I think that's an imp important movement. But the most important movement is the idea of a God which, which, which is not. Um, it's an infinite cosmology, right? He's not uh, uh, previously determining the moral order of the world. He's offering a certain idea which can potentially be realized. But it cannot be also, right? So there is freedom. That's freedom, in a sense. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in no other religion am I aware of where the, the very idea of free will became a problem. Be, before that, yeah. it just didn't yeah, matter. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the point, right? And, and Christianity made that, like, millennials before that became a problem to, to, to philosophy itself, right? Like an actual central problem in modernity. So, uh, yeah. and, and and I would like to make another commentary too, because these we are not we didn't we didn't get to the point in which we are going to talk about relation here, right? And in its relations with family, but there is in Brazil many uh, uh, descendants from Africans. They 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 have this idea that. They, they are going to go there and they are going to, to get into some religion or another and they will love that religion and Christianity sucks and stuff. But the problem is that most religions in Africa and in most parts of the world, they are familiar, familial. They, they, they are not universal. That, that, that's another important point which is, which is a common both to Islam and to Christianity, the idea of a public... Uh, universal religion, right? And yep. there is no such a thing in Africa. You need to prove that you are a descendant. You know? Otherwise, you, you cannot participate. You, you participate as a descendant. Not as a universal being, a person, right? In, in the universal abstract sense of it. Yes, that's interesting. I actually haven't looked into a into uh, African religions, I've only known about some, yeah. like some small cults, like a uh, certain uh, Santeria cults in Cuba, and uh, it's, it's very similar to the Greek ancient, the ancient Greek familiar uh, uh, rites. You know, very, very familiar, very, 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 very similar. I think there is a unity to the ancient world, man. Like, uh, for example, I'm seeing here, of course, of course. Like, like the Chinese family has its similarities, but there are a lot of senses in a lot in a lot of ways. Many ancient civilizations shared the same characteristics: this idea, this contempt towards the individual, this idea of certain certain um, uh, conventional roles being much more important than the person itself. That would fulfill those roles and realize those roles, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, certainly. I think there there definitely is a unity of uh, the ancient past, which uh, we are generally ignorant of. Uh, you know, but also, 
in academia, perennialism is not a very uh, well-regarded topic, even though, uh, I don't know, to me, like it, it seems like such <laughs> an obvious thing uh, with a certain like level of historical background. Obviously, there's, there's specific differences, but uh, the general general forms are there. It's really interesting. Uh, yeah. But anyways, uh, that was some good reading. That was chapter two. For those of you listening, hopefully uh, you found it interesting. See you next time.